Okay, so gold box conjecture is simply the idea that if you pick any even number greater than 2, there's some way to add two prime numbers together and get that number. Goldbach was a contemporary of Leonard Euler, so you can see that he actually wrote the conjecture in a letter to Euler in 1742. And in all this time, it has never been proven. It's only been tested all the way up to 4 times 10 to the 18th power, and it has always held up. Obviously, it's been around for hundreds of years. We're not going to prove it today, but we can test it. So we're going to create some numbers. If we want integers greater than or equal to 2, we can simply add 2 to this series. And then to double it, we can simply say that. Also in J, you can say that is the double primitive. Now to get some prime numbers, again, we start with um, I10, the first 10 non-negative integers. And we're going to add this P colon prefix. So now we have the first 10 prime numbers. If we want an addition table of the prime numbers. And in fact, um, we can put the word table in here, and that gives us a nicely formatted table. Now, if you study this table carefully, you'll see that it contains all the even numbers between 4 and 42, but it's missing 44 and 50 and so on, so it's not complete. But there's no reason that we should be checking a table manually when we have a computer here that can check it for us. So we can use the word E to test whether a particular number is in a set. You can think of it as asking whether the number is an element of the array. And in fact, you can actually say if the elements of this array are elements of this array here. And these two are. If we say 8, then we're going to get a 0 in there because this 8 does not appear over here. And if we add an 8 to that list, we'll get three ones. So now let's get our list of even numbers back. And in fact, we're going to go ahead and say 20 because that gets us up to number 42. Let's give this a name. We're going to call it evens. And now if we type evens, we get the values. And let's call this, how about p sums or sum of primes? What we want to say now is evens is an element of p sums. We'll test whether that's true or not. Um, and it's going to give us a zero. And that has to do with the rank of this thing. So you can see that p-sums is a two-dimensional array. In J, you would say it's a rank two array. Basic question zero is the rank at which this verb, E, operates. The answer says that it operates at rank infinity, meaning it's, it's going to operate on the outermost rank of its arguments. The first infinity here is saying what happens when you say E one, two, three, or something like that, where there's no left argument. Don't worry what this means right now. The important point is there's different behavior depending on whether there's a left side argument or not. Well, let's say that we have I three, three, which is this. Now, the array as a whole contains items of which are rows. So this is, this is an array of three arrays, zero, one, two, and three, four, five, and six, seven, eight. And if we say three, four, five, E, I33, three, three, it's going to say 1 because that row exists in the array. Um, but if I just want to know if the number 3 exists in here, oops, 3 E I33, three, three, um, it's going to say 0 because this is not an item in this. To change that, we can take this and add a ravel in front of it, which is a comma. The word ravel comes from the idea when you're knitting like a sweater and you pull the string and the sweater will unravel. Ravel and unravel mean the same thing. Anyway, this gives you the content of the array without the structure. It reduces it to a rank one array or a vector. And so now we can say, is three an element of the Ravel of I33? And the answer is yes. What about three, four, five again? We get one, one, one. What about three, nine, five? Well, the nine isn't there. Okay, so to recap, we have evens and we have p sums and we're going to ravel p sums and we're going to ask for each item in evens is it an element of the ravel of p sums so this is returning an array of bits one bit for every item in evens so if we say what's the length of evens it's 20 items what's the length of this array and we get 20 items um, what is the sum of all those ones 
and we get 20. So we can say, does the sum equal the length? And then that should say one. But there's a much better way to do that, and which is to insert the AND operator in between all the items. So when you say one, zero, one, and you add them together, this is as if you were saying one plus zero plus one. And if you say AND instead of add, it's as if you're saying one and zero and one which is zero because zero means false and when you and false with something you always get zero if they're all true you get one so basically you could pronounce this word as all and we could then say all evens are elements of the rabble of piece and that should say one i prefer to just write it i know this is more readable if you're not used to j but once you get used to it it's perfectly obvious what this means and it just seems cleaner once you know the notation just as if you had to say two plus two to get four well you could say plus equals and then this works this then is testing that all the evens are elements of the rabble of p-sums so as it stands now if we ask for the type of evens and the type of p-sums we're going to see that they're both nouns. This only gives us the chance to test for the 20 numbers in evens. And what I'd like to do is parameterize this. So let's redefine evens. Right now we've defined evens as, um, this is a test. I'm going to test the following assertion. I'm going to say that evens matches uh, 2 times 2 plus i20. And it should say 1, that they match. Uh, if I say equal, I get that. And if I said that, I should get 1. And that, it's very similar, it's not exactly, but it's the, the idea is similar to what, what this operation does. So 2 times 2 plus i20 should match evens, and it does. Um, and so now let's just redefine it. But instead of saying i20, um, I'm going to say that, that there's some y, and rather than make it 20, let's make it 10. And then we're going to say 2 times y, and we're going to say that this matches as well. It does. And since it matches, let's do that. And then we're going to remove this part, quote the whole thing, and then I'm going to say it's a verb. Um, and so now if I say evens 10, I get that. If I say evens 20, I should see even more numbers. And if I say evens 5, I should get 10 numbers. Um, and we can test that by saying what is the length of that list. So now if I ask for this, the type of evens and p-sums, I'm going to get a verb and a noun. But I want to do the same thing I just did for p-sums. When we did, defined p-sums, the sum of primes, we said it was, let's test this again, it's the sum table of the primes i10. Again, we already said that y equals 10, so I'm just going to say i y, and again, I'm going to make it a verb. Whoops, I've made a mistake here, because now I'm not assigning it, I'm, I'm checking it. And when you check for the verb, it, it's doing some weird things here. I'm going to redefine it. Um, and now we get a verb and a verb. And p sums of 10 should give us that. Now notice that I didn't define what y is, but y is not um, this y. I can say erase uh, y. And then what, what is y? We don't know. Um, and yet p sums 10 is still going to work. Um, and p sums 5 is going to give us a smaller item, and p sums 15 will give us a bigger one. And the reason for that is that whenever you say verb, uh, y, you're defining a verb, and y is simply the name of the right argument. So 1, 2, 3, 4 is going to give us that. You can actually be more specific. It's not just a, a, a verb, it's a monad. A, a monad is a verb that has one argument on the right hand side. 1, 2, 3, 4 is going to give us that. Um, the argument here is an array. Uh, an array and a scalar, it doesn't matter, it's just that it's the argument on the right hand side. And if we say dyad, then now it's going to require two arguments. And if I press enter here, it's going to complain about it because I, I said it's a dyad, but I only gave it one argument. Um, and so now if I say a, b, c, d, e, f, g, um, it's going to give me that. And if I say y here, it's going to give me that. P sums should be a monad, and I want it to have the following definition. The ravel of the table of sums of the primes uh, for the right argument. And if I say p sums 10, I should get uh, the list. Um, if we want to show the whole thing, we can reshape it again, and we get the original list. But 
I just incorporated the comma because that way we don't have to use it here. We can just say uh, evens element of p sums again. But remember, these are both verbs now. So we have three verbs together. Now this is a verb, and we can take that verb and put parentheses around it, and we can call it 10, and we get our original list of numbers. This is called a fork. What's happening is this number is being fed into this and this, and then the results are being uh, fed into this. So it's as if we're saying evens 10 element of p sums 10. Are these elements in p sums 10? And so what we're doing is we're factoring out that 10 and then putting these together. And, and, and J does this for us. It's just part of the syntax of J. So now we have evens and we have p-sums defined. And these are actually all we need to test the Goldbach conjecture up to an arbitrarily large number. For example, if we want to test the first 2,000 even numbers greater than 2, uh, we just say same thing we've been doing this whole time evens are element of p-sums 2,000, and we get a bunch of ones. And since that's too many to see, it's actually hopefully 4,000. It is. We can just use our little all trick, and um, we get one. So they are all sums of two prime numbers. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not terribly satisfied with that. It would be nice if we could actually look and see what the prime numbers are that are being added together. And so very quickly, I'm going to show you how to do that. When you say p-sums 20, Actually, we're going to do 5. The length of this is 25. It's, it's obviously a 5 by 5 table that has been unraveled. Whenever you have a grid like this, you can take the width of the grid and you can divide any particular number. If you have um, I, 5, 5, you can take the index of a, of a position here. So, for example, let's say 23. Um, divide this by 5. And then we're going to take the 4. And this is telling us which row the number 23 is going to be in. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then if we take 23 and we take the remainder when we divide by 5, oops, in J, you say it the other way around. 3. So 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, we can make a little fork that does exactly this. Um, we can compose um, the floor. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just use uh, the reverse of division. I'm going to, I'm going to flip the order on this one rather than this one. Um, and then compose it with the um, with the remainder or the residue. Uh, and we're, I'm going to call this div mod. We now have this. And what, what I wanted was to see them in pairs. And, and, and adding this dot here um, allows me to do that. And you can see that these are really just counting up to um, to 25. 0 to 24 in base 5. So another way we can do that is say I 25, uh, 5, 5, base. So now we can take these, we can box them, but let's box the individual items. And the parentheses are to separate that 1 from the 5 and the 5, otherwise it would be an argument to the base or anti-base, whatever that is. Uh, and then we're going to take this and then we're going to reshape it back to 5, 5 here. Oops. You, you can see that this table corresponds to the positions uh, in here. And so simply by using this phrase, or our div mod, we can use either one. You get the same thing. And what that's telling you is it gives us a way to map these numbers to these coordinates. 5 div mod i 5 5. Well, it's, <laughs> it's a mess to see this. Um, but you can say each. Oops. There you go. And that's also the same thing. So what I want to do with this now is I want to go back to p sums. And previously we had said evens e p sums, right, for however many numbers. Ooh, and we have a zero. So the zero here, <laughs> we can actually explore this in a minute. The zero here is just because I, I chose to double the number. And, and it looks like we just don't have enough primes. Remember we said in evens, we're taking two times y. And if we just take this number back down to y so that the number of primes and the number of evens are the same, then the number of primes should be more than ample to cover that. So, so now we're only looking at five numbers. But we can also say p sum 5 and 5, 5, reshape p sums 5. And it looks like uh, evens 10 would have been 22, which is there, but 20 is not there. So the next to the last one is not in this table yet. So we needed actually probably p sums 6. And finally it shows up. 
So we just didn't have enough primes. And the fifth prime number is 13, which is much higher than 2 times 5, simply because primes are rare and even numbers are common. So the, the primes are going to be much larger and, and, and therefore they're, you're almost certain to have enough coverage here. So to go back to what I was saying, we were doing this before, but instead of E, we can use a verb called I. And the order for what we want to do is actually going to be in the opposite order. So we're going to switch them around. Um, I could have said uh, I and then put the tilde there to swap them. It doesn't matter. W what this is telling you, it's the index of these even numbers in P sums. Just to give you a simpler example, uh, if we say hello, what is the index of the E? It's at index 1. What's the index of the H? 0. And we're just doing the same thing here. Um, so P sums 5 is this. So you can see this is in the that slot, P sums 5, 6 is up here in the 6th slot, and we can uh, join it with this, whoops, um, because that would be a square number. Um, so we're going to square the argument here. And get... So this is, this column here is the, uh, is I of the square, and actually we can do this to get a little more compact representation. So this uh, row now is the index. See, these are just in sequential order. And here are the values in the table. And we know how to map the index to the position in the table. Well, let's look at the table again. In fact, let's look at it like this. I'm going to put the word table in there again. And then I5. If we can find the coordinates of a number in this table, which we know how to do because we used the, the div mod trick or the, or the base 5 trick, that tells us which prime numbers were added together to get this value. So now let's look at the position of this 12 here. So I want position 13. So um, I5, 5, 13 is here. Um, and let's actually just do it like this. So 13 equals that. And you can see that the 1 is right there. So the index of 12 is is 13. This is this is slot 13 here. If we say 5, 5, uh, 13, we get 2, 3. And what this means is it's index 13 has the value 12 here, and it's at coordinates 2, 3 within this table. In fact, let's do this again. We'll take this out. And if we say 2, 3, and we extract that, we want to um, box this number, then we get the value 12. If we want the number right underneath that, we would say 3, 3, um, and we get 14, which is the number right underneath it. And if we wanted the one to the left, we would have said 2, 2. So the index of the evens in the p-sums for the first five numbers, take that index, div mod by 5, and then we now have these row and column numbers, and now we can map those back to the primes. Okay, if we wanted to, we could actually put um, evens, uh, 5, and just kind of put that next to it. So what this is telling us now is that the number 4 is the sum of 2 and 2, which are prime numbers. 6 is the sum of 3 and 3. 8 is the sum of 3 and 5. 10 is the sum of 3 and 7. And 12 is the sum of 5 and 7. Okay, so now let's just actually go ahead and turn this um, into a function. And this is not going to be like the most elegant function, because I'm just kind of cobbling it together from you know, whatever's in front of me, um, but it's a monad, and then we can pass this, and now we've got a verb, and then uh, let's call this Goldbach. So now we can take the first 20 Goldbach numbers, and we get this. We can take the first 200 Goldbach numbers, and we get a big long thing like this, and we can verify that 402 is an even number, and, and the 397 is a prime number, and 5 is a, a prime number, and you add those two together and you get 402. And of course, at this point, we can just start seeing how many of these numbers can we calculate. But I'm not going to do that because when I tried it a little while ago, the video recording software is taking up a lot of RAM and it just slowed my computer to a crawl. It could be that this algorithm is just not very good. But let's say that we want to take 200 and we want to get the 35th um, Goldbach number, which should be 37 times 2, I would think. We'll see. 74. 37 times 2. Yeah, so um, there it is. 71 is a prime number. 3 is a prime number. You add them together, you get 74. And so that is our test of the gold block number. Here it is. We could clean it up considerably, but it's done the job. And that's kind of the nice thing about J. You can work out some really complicated stuff at the prompt here without really having to write a standalone program. And it's easy to cobble together, you know, some rather long chains of code. And hopefully this code isn't too cryptic. So just for reference, here is evens. Here is div mod. I'm just going across here. Here's p sums. Um, 
and evens again. So that is the complete code to our Goldbach verb with the Goldbach number and then the two primes that are summed to get that number.